Hopping on a plane may still be a little ways away, but that doesn't mean that you can't get your travel fill in other ways. Food is all about adding spice to our life and bringing people together. Food also has the power to reignite our adventurous spirit. You can just ask our next guest. His culinary adventures have taken him around the world. He's a Food Network staple and a master at creating home-cooked meals that Canadians love. He and his wife took to the East Coast years ago and are the proprietors at the Inn at Bay Fortune on Prince Edward Island, renowned for its five-star hospitality and farm-to-table dining. And a fun fact, he was the head chef in the Athletes' Village at the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver and Whistler when I competed. So I'm thrilled to sit down today and have a chat with acclaimed chef, Michael Smith. Thanks for joining us here on the Northern Take, Chef Michael. Where do I find you today? Hey, John, I'm uh, home on Prince Edward Island. I'm actually in my test kitchen today, hanging out. I imagine there's all kinds of wonderful dishes that are being created as we speak. So let's get into the food discussion and we might as well hit it off right at the beginning. I I'm curious to know when food turned from uh, something that you just stuff in your mouth and, and get into your belly and into something into something more. When did it take on more meaning in your life for you? I guess I'd have to say when I when I got a job cooking. For me, uh, cooking was something I had to do out of necessity when I went to university and I found myself with a brand new car and tooling around town and, and car payments. And the easiest job to get in uh, really in any university town is somehow in a kitchen. So I ended up cooking that way. And and really, it, all of a sudden, it all just started to come home because I wasn't there for cooking school or anything. I was actually in art school. And, and I had grown up in a home where my mom cooked for me constantly for my brothers and I every single day. And it wasn't a big deal. It's just what every mom did, you know. But it wasn't really until, uh, until I found myself in, a, in the world of professional kitchens that I discovered this other world of food and uh, started to take it really seriously. Well, you mentioned that, that your mom cooked for yourself and your brothers. And... I mean, that's a very similar upbringing to what I experienced. We ate all of our meals together, essentially, because when you grow up in a podunk town like Russell, Manitoba, uh, there's only 1,500 people. You can come home for lunch. So we did breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. What was eating as a family unit? What did that mean to you growing up? And how has that shaped, I guess, the future in your family life now? John, it's everything. It's everything. And like so many of life's great lessons, it's one of those things that I didn't necessarily take note of growing up. I certainly lived it every day and I certainly benefited from it, but maybe didn't appreciate it until I sort of became an adult myself. And, and now as a father and a husband and as a neighbor, I understand the power of coming together around the table. I understand that. It's in my soul. And I, and I now understand how thankful I am to my mom for making that happen as kids because really context is everything in food you know or as i like to say i think who's at the table matters far far more than what's on that table you know i've built my life around that and i, I feel so blessed that my mom gave me that as a kid as you know as one of life's great lessons you mentioned neighbor that's not often something that people throw into the mix you want to talk a little bit about that i, I mean sure i mean isn't that the essence of being a good canadian <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm a guy who came from away. I'm a guy who feels like I moved home when I came to, to Prince Edward Island for the first time. And, and I guess uh, so much of that, now that I've had 30 years to sort of think it through, I know that so much of that is, is because of the community and, uh, and, a, because, and being in a place where you are a neighbor and, and the values that, that accrue to you because of that and the lessons you learn and the implicit responsibility. And ultimately, hey, as I said, that's, that's what being a good Canadian is all about, being a good neighbor. It's pretty simple. You bring up a couple points that I, I want to get to in just a little bit of time here. But first, let's get back to the beginning. And how did you find yourself at the Culinary School of America? And what was the impetus to simply, I, I guess, from a needs perspective, cooking to a passion? How did that transform? And Sure. Where did that happen? Gosh. I, I now look back and I understand how lucky I was. I was in some pretty darn good kitchens very quickly and working my way up those ranks. And there I was running my own big shot kitchen, you know, a place called Tiffany's on the Bay. Gosh, if anyone remembers <laughs> that place in Rochester, That New sounds York, fancy. You know, and, oh, it, it, well, it, at least it tried to be fancy. And, and, I, and it, was, it, was a, it was a good experience. And I, I do know that... Um, you know, I want to say, gosh, it wasn't long, maybe three, four, five, six months into that experience, I realized, like, this is it. I'm going to be a chef. I found my path. 
this is it i'm going to do this for the rest of my life and i remember this moment i was in a shower i was getting ready to go to work that morning i'm in the shower getting all excited i'm going to work i'm going to make the soup of the day it's going to do that and and i realized this is it and i went to work and quit because <laughs> i also realized that if it really is it then I need to be the best. I need to go to the top. And there's only one way. I got to go to the Culinary Institute of America. I got to go to cooking school. You know, I, I, got, I got to go back to the bottom because I didn't trust all that knowledge I'd earned along the way. I was only like three, four years in at that point, really. And, and I wanted to do what I'd heard was the way to do it. You know, like all the people that were, I was reading about had gone to this fancy school. So I'm going too. And off I went. And then once you had the education, your globe trotting just began. Take us a bit across the map with where some of the places that you landed after culinary school were and how, sure. I guess, those experiences shaped your, your perspective on food. Yeah, I basically went straight to Europe. I, I landed in London and um, worked in particular at a Michelin three-star restaurant. There were 19 in the world at the time. So, you know, hey, one of the top 20 restaurants on the globe, blah, blah, blah. But more importantly, just this, this, this intensely, intensely difficult place. You know, every, like literally Gordon Ramsay learned how to be Gordon Ramsay in the same kitchen. Like he apprenticed there like three years before I did. And, you know, that whole culture that we see, you know, it's very real. It's truly real. And I lived it. I, I took it. I took it hard for a year. And, and uh, I never want to do that again. And I really, after, after that experience, I was more bound and determined to not do anything I had learned and seen than, than, than to embrace it, honestly. Like it was so degrading and so useless, you, you know, to be treated that way by that system. And I wasn't the only one. I mean, it was, it was all the apprentices are treated that way in that classic system, you know, and I just, I rebelled against it. I couldn't take it. So I, I ended up back in New York working for a fellow named David Boulay, the time best restaurant in America. So a good place to land and um, worked hard there, worked on the fish station, um, often shoulder to shoulder with Chef, who strolled in like a rock star like 10 minutes before service every day, you know, he, with his <laughs> latest supermodel girlfriend, whatever. Um, but we worked hard, we cooked hard, but something was missing. I would go after work, I'd find myself at the bar chatting up a pretty girl and I'd say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working for David Boulay, and you'd let that settle in. And at the time, it actually had a little bit of currency. <laughs> And then I would say, but, 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 but I really want to move out to the country and plant a, plant a garden and meet some farmers. And I didn't know what that meant, really. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that it meant something to me. And so, once again, I did it. And I remember driving down the, the gangplank of the ferry on the Prince Edward Island for the first time and tuning in CBC radio to see where is this, this place I've landed. And they go straight into the funeral announcements. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I'm in a different place. And uh, I'm so glad that I was in a different place. I came home. It's been 30 years. I grew up here. I became a man here. And a chef and a cook and, and a neighbor and everything because of this place, Prince Edward Island. So glad. You were born in the States, and now you are one of Canada's most celebrated and acclaimed chefs. How does that feel to, as you put it, come from afar or come from away, as they say on the East Coast, and, and now be considered one of our own, having been adopted here in Canada? Thank you. It feels really good. You know, <laughs> honestly, 30 years later, I'm sitting here in the Atlantic bubble looking at New York City. Do I need a reminder why I did that? all that all that time ago it wasn't so much that i left anywhere so much as i found canada and prince edward island in particular um i didn't set out to leave new york or you know you don't grow up as an american what are you going to be when you grow up i'm going to be a canadian no it's not <laughs> how it played out really i got lucky um this place is very real it's very special it, it's a real community I've had the pleasure and opportunity to work in many cities around the world and, and I've continued to travel and I've had so many great, great adventures along the way and met so many great people. And I know that all the things that I've been able to achieve over these, you know, sort of last 30 years, I wouldn't have been able to do them without the firm roots I have on this island. For those who haven't been yet and haven't made the pilgrimage to PEI, paint a little bit of a picture of, of what the island was like then and what it's like now maybe in contrast. I love painting that picture. Prince Edward Island 
is a great big giant green farm floating in the deep blue sea surrounded by white <laughs> sandy beaches and full of real food stories. I was lucky I showed up at the right time and with that outsider's perspective and I started looking around and I realized this place is a, a straight up chef's paradise. Are you kidding? Look around. Everything is here. Everything is produced here. Everything is grown. Everything. Like, how could you not want to be a chef here? You know, and here we are now. I'm surrounded by all kinds of great chefs, all kinds of great restaurants. Uh, the Culinary Institute of Canada has created so much momentum. Our, our festivals, Fall Flavors, is one of the world's most authentic and amazingly successful true food experiences. Six weeks of it. On and on and on the list goes. And, but the reasons why haven't changed because none of it 30 years ago and none of it today would work if it wasn't for the very real authenticity of this place we make food here and and that's where you want to be a chef the smorgasbord of of ingredients that one can use to create dishes allowed you to i guess find a, a home on pei and and then 20 years later, you find yourself cooking for athletes at the 2010 Games in the Athletes Village in Vancouver and Whistler. What was that experience like, first of all? And how the heck do you cook for teams from 85 different countries and give them a sense of home and the capacity to be at their best on the day that matters most? And, and that's your job. Gee whiz, John. It, it, without question, well, up until this year, that was the greatest professional challenge in my life. It truly was. I was honored to be asked to lead the team of chefs that cooked for the athletes of the world um, in the Whistler Athletes Village. And I uh, was happy to help feed you there quite a bit. And, and wow, well, I, I, you know, the, the holes that we had to dig ourselves out of, the massive, the massive amount of, of, of problems that we had to solve, challenges over and over and over again. It was, it was crazy just to open the doors and be ready to serve 13,000 meals a day. And uh, ultimately, you know, I'm proud that we, we were able to serve 85 different teams and we met with so many of those teams and served them with, with grace and did it on behalf of Canada. You know, we've got to do our best so that they can do their best. And, you know, and I met all kinds of cool people. And I remember the, uh, the Scandinavians in particular, you know, when they first got there, they were all fired up about all the choices. I remember all the choices in the place. And, and, but they wanted treats that were dairy free. And we kind of missed that, um, the cookies. And I went in the back and I said, guys, the, you know, the, uh, the Swedes are here and the Norwegians and, and we got to get some cookies made for them and, and just make sure they have cardamom. I don't care how you make them, make sure they're, they're dairy free and they load them up with cardamom. And I knew this from traveling around the world that that's the, the spice they love up there. And so within 24 hours, I was able to hand them, you know, this, these beautiful cardamom cookies and, it, and they just, I swear it brought a tear to their eye. You know, it made them feel like they were at home, you know, and that is so often the context of food, eh? So proud on so many levels, so proud to have, have done it in our own little way, out of the spotlight, just leading a team of good, hard-working folks doing our best. And it, it, what a memory. How are you going to maybe celebrate the holidays this year and with your family, given that there are limitations on how much we can congregate and, and use food as this means by which to come together? Yeah, well, I'm going to do it differently this year. And I'm going to hope that next year I get to do it maybe the way I used to do it. Very simple. I mean, there's so much to talk about here now, and, and you know, and especially in terms of safety and gathering and all of it. But right back to simplicity. Don't. Yeah. People, this is about being safe. This is about being a good neighbor. This is not about pushing bounds. Not right now. Not if you love yourself and the people around you. So... No, pretty simple. We're just not going to have a big gathering this year. Even here in the middle of the Atlantic bubble, it's not a thing. You know, I'm used to cooking for like 25 people in the holidays. I love that. You know, I'm the guy that built an entire business around the idea of bringing strangers together shoulder to shoulder at great big long feast tables. I'm going to miss it terribly this year. But at the same time, nope, pretty straight ahead. Put your masks on. You know, we know what we're supposed to do. It's, you know, this, this is not a time to push bounds. Not, not this time of year. No way. 
Well, and that's your your personal life when you're cooking for 25 people. But in your professional life, you have a business. You employ people. Uh, you've got bills to pay. How have you pivoted in the face of adversity uh, with what's going on presently in the world? John, we just um, finished our season on Prince Edward Island. Uh, we had a very interesting year, as you might imagine, um, and we squeaked out a win. Yeah. Um, we're a seasonal business in the first place. Uh, we're only ever open five months of a year, almost six. We, we grow what we serve. We're a farm. We cook it all with live fire. And most importantly, as I've always said, what we do is we bring people together. It's a shared communal experience. It's largely outdoors. Um, and that's certainly what it was last year. And then this year, all of a sudden, January, by January, I knew, you know, I, I, I called it early. By early February, we had our big red flag meeting and shut it all down for the year. Had no idea, you know, what it was like all winter long, you know, just the terror of, of uncertainty, you know, and then lo and behold, out of nowhere comes this Atlantic bubble and next thing you know, we're open. <laughs> As I said to my team in February, very, very clear goals in mind. I said, just like I said 10 years ago at the Olympics, it's the values that got us here that will get us out. And so this year, it became all about safety. And so we, one of Canada's very best restaurants, we made it to number 31 this year. You know, we're an intricate, fine dining place. And we're not a high volume, takeout joint, but that's what we had to become because I wanted, I had to, I had to create something for my team. I had to put them to work. I had to at least try, you know, I've got family after family after family that has moved from off Prince Edward Island, lock, stock and barrel, mom, dad, and the kids to be a part of our business, you know, and I've got to honor that. And so we did, we, we became a takeout joint. And that means we did picnics and we filled our front lawn and we never saw it coming. We hit a thousand a week and it just blew us away. And our, our team just kept working harder and harder. They never gave up. We never gave up, never saw it coming. We saved our business with those picnics and we made a lot of people happy. We put people together around tables. I'd look out over that lawn, over looking at the ocean, and I'd see 25 picnic tables just sitting there full of families all summer long, you know, that needed that. And it wasn't, it wasn't for any other reason than, than we're trying to stay safe here. Because my team's inside. They don't see it. They're inside. They're safe as can be. We're a takeout joint. So it worked. I remember in April, March. I don't even remember the day. I just know that in the middle of all that uncertainty, back when none of us knew where this was going, nobody knew. Time froze there for a while. It just froze. And I found myself in our herb house one day, middle of March, in the dead of winter. I walk into that herb house and the greens were starting to grow. Things were coming out of the earth. There was herbs there. There was, there was life. Seeing that, those herbs don't know that there's a pandemic going on, do they? They just keep yeah. doing what they're doing, and it's almost uh, that we need to take a cue from our natural environment as to how to push forward. And a testament to you and, and your crew that y y you can obviously tell the sense of pride that you have in, in surviving a really tough season. And I think it speaks volumes to your leadership once again and to the team that you've developed there. And uh, people need comfort in a time of uncertainty and food can be that what are some yes. things that you provide to your your guests that is rooted in comfort and what is comfort food to you john it's it's you're so right it's the context isn't it it's not just what we eat it's the context like for us it was brisket you know like we're a fire driven restaurant i'm surrounded by by chefs that have, that have cooked all over the world and, and just are drawn to cooking with the fresh ingredients of our farm and cooking with live fire. And, and every one of us in that world, every one of us has our bucket list. And on top of that bucket list is brisket, beef brisket, smoking brisket in an old school offset pit smoker. You know, every one of us wants to do that at least once in our career, you know, and it just never made sense around here until this year. And so, 
we built ourselves an old-fashioned pit smoker, the beast, and we set to work. And Chef Chris Gibb, I'm so blessed to have a chef de cuisine backing me up who's just a masterful cook. Well, he bonded with the beast like a Vulcan, <laughs> you know, and, and mastered our brisket. And that's comfort food, you know. As I like to say, look, if you can grill a hamburger in your backyard, that's kindergarten. You know, smoking a brisket, that's a PhD. We got to yeah. do that this year. So, so comfort for us, too. And so many magical takeaways there for the listeners right now, and lots of them entrepreneurs and wired that way. So when you can and have to pivot, pivot with passion and nothing can hold you down. That's uh, pretty genius stuff you just threw out there. And during this time when we can't travel, I think that we can turn to the flavors of the world to be able to fill that void a little bit. And if you're willing to stick with me here right now, I'd like to play a little bit of a game. And I'm going to say a country's name, and I want you to tell me your most favorite food that's associated with that country. You, you with me? Okay. I'm in. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out easy here for you. Your favorite food associated with the country of Mexico. Oh, gosh, corn tortillas, like real handmade corn tortillas, freshly toasted in some back alley. I, I, who cares what's in the tortilla? Just a proper corn tortilla. Double wrapped. I think they do it double wrapped in Mexico City, don't sure. they? Sure, triple wrap that them. baby. And yeah. give me extras. <laughs> They're so good. Germany. Sausages and beer. Oh, mm. yeah, sausages and beer. At 8 a.m. <laughs> a lot White of sausage. beer. Don't ask me about the sausage. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> How about Thailand. Oh gosh, maybe maybe the best thing I've ever eaten in my life in Thailand on a just a rickety old street corner, a, a street vendor making me papaya salad, and I will never forget that papaya salad. I I, I got to go. I got to get on a plane. Oh, I can't. I can't. Oh, we're salivating right salad. now. Oh man, the good I stuff. I want it. Let's head to India. Oh gosh, lentils. Canadian lentils in India. I we, the, the, I've been to India. Um, and went there on behalf of Canadian lentils and discovered the gold standard. Like, wow, the reverence, the Canadian lentils. They are on the top shelf. They're on the gold pedestal. They're the ones that all the other world's lentils are compared to. And in Gujarat state, a vegetarian state, uh, wow. So just a lot of lentils, a lot of great, just, it's so um, simple to say curry. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm so broadly generalizing when I say that. There's just so much intricacy to it in, in India and, and the ones that I experience in Gujarat, just amazing, the spices and the flavors of, of the cooking there. Lentils. Now let's bring it home to our country. How about Canada? Oysters. Yes. Oysters. Yeah, oysters. Oysters, oh, I could go on for years. Oysters to me are all about context they're always shared with friends they're always an instant party there's so much passion that goes into serving them the the shucking the raising and and i could i could i can see them i can see them from here where dennis raises his fortune bay oysters that we shuck at the end we shucked fifty six thousand last year i don't want to add it up this year i think we're going to come in around eleven thousand um, but we're going to shuck a whole lot more next year. Oysters. I love Canadian oysters. Well, I also uh, hosted the, uh, for a few times, the international, the World International Invitational Oyster Shucking Contest, and you mentioned it. There's passion, there's uh, a flurry of activity, and there's sometimes also stitches. So you, you can have quite the party when you're shucking oysters, and I have been to that oyster farm there, so I can, I, I can picture in my mind's eye what you're actually looking at right now, all those socks yeah. where the oysters are growing on. And there obviously, the inn at Bay Fortune is somewhere that is on my bucket list. I want you to describe it a little bit, because as everybody says, the word magical comes up in conversation when they're describing it. So from your perspective, talk about what people can see, experience, and what it's like to be a patron at, what, at this establishment. Thank you, John. Thanks for asking. Uh, we, my wife and I, Chaz, bought my alma mater six years ago. We set out to create an interactive experience. I, it's far, far transcends restaurant. It's not a restaurant. Uh, it's something way, way more. Our guests come late afternoon. They join us for a farm tour. There's all kinds of tastes along the way. Um, they meet our farmer. They learn what sustainable regenerative agriculture is and all the many things that we do on our farm. 
And then they, uh, they find their way to Oyster Rock and Oyster Hour begins. And we spend an hour outside. Um, we open up the fire garden and that's like going to the coolest ever backyard party, steampunk fire driven hors d'oeuvres for an hour, <laughs> five or six different stations and the Oyster Bar where we say every day, slurp all you like, we're not keeping score. Sassy shucking. And then we all head inside for basically a seven course meal that, um, well, in the past was served communally at long butcher block tables, shoulder to shoulder with strangers. Now we are now doing that little bit differently, socially distant tables, um, but we're still very much an outdoor experience. And so the end of the evening is actually spent back at the campfire toasting homemade marshmallows. And we do every single bit of that with, with passion, with, with intelligence, with, with a certain deliberateness. And now six years in, I can really, I can really say what it is we're doing. And I've, I've really come to understand that, you know, especially at this stage of my life, I mean, hey, I'm not some guy running around hosting Food Network shows anymore. You know, I'm, I'm proud of where I am in my life and I'm, I'm happy to be home and I'm happy, I wanna get up and do something real each and every day. And I wanna share it with as many people as I can. And, and so to have that team around, as I mentioned, is, it's really what it's all about. It's, it's the path now, it's doing something real. You know, at the same time as I say those words, so cognizant of how lucky we are that we can even think about next year and even imagine next year, you know, that we're here in our Atlantic bubble and we're home as Canadians, but at the same time, so aware of so much loss, you know, so many friends, colleagues, just an industry decimated, you know, and there's really no other way to put it. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot more work ahead of us. That's for sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm literally having trouble staying focused when you describe uh, the atmosphere, the experience, and I will be on your front lawn, drink in hand. And if you need a lawn boy, I'm there. I'll cut your grass, but I am uh, trying to figure out a way in which I can live uh, in your back pocket. Can you shuck oysters? Because, oh, I'll learn, brother. I've got my oyster <laughs> shucker. I, I'll learn to do it. I'll, I'll promise you I'll find a role for myself because I'm coming. You're in. If people can actually pull themselves away from the property long enough to explore the rest of the island, what is perhaps one spot that you're going to catch heat for, uh, for recommending something that is maybe a local spot? And, and trust me, we're in a safe place here, Michael. You can dish. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Gee whiz. You know, I would, uh, I would, well, look, the easy answer is go to a beach. Okay, any beach. All right, any beach. So I have to say that part because that is Prince Edward Island. That's what's so magical about coming to Prince Edward Island. You can have every beach on the planet. Like what kind of beach do you want? You want the one with the 5,000 kids running wild? Okay, go over there. You want the quiet one with nobody in sight for miles? Okay, go over there. You want the, you want the nude beach? All right. Well, I'm <laughs> not going to tell you where one. that one is now, am I? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Front the beaches, but um, in particular, um, you know, come with that kind of expectation. That's why you come to Prince Edward Island. You know, you come to be outside, you come to find safe sanctuary, you come to experience the outdoors undigitally, so to speak. You know, we're still that kind of place, you know, going on down to the wharf and watching the, the fellas bring the catch in sort of place. Now, let's open this up to Canada wide. Is there a restaurant in this country that uh, you've experienced that is a must try, something that people need to seek out in order to experience and, and have to give it a rip. Sure, there are so many, John. Um, and I'm always, of course, drawn to the, you know, the hole in the wall spots that are out in the yeah. middle of nowhere, deep in the country somewhere where nobody's gonna ever find it. Um, and so bucket list, um, there's a place on Cape Breton Island called the Bite House. And mm. it is it's like a little mini version of the Inip Bay Fortune. Buddy's got his own garden and there's just a couple of them in the kitchen and they only serve six people a day at the farmhouse table and every single thing they grew themselves. Ah, uh, yeah, the Bite House, Cape Breton Island. I haven't actually been there yet, but that's where I want to go. So, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a good example. And I guess, you know, look around. Wherever you're hearing these words, look around. You're way out uh, in Sioux Harbor House territory. I mean, there's... You're, you're in a, a part of the world that's just loaded with great hole-in-the-wall spots. So let's honor that, you know? 
we, we, we sort of found more of that in ourselves this year, looking around our own backyards and discovering treasures. Now, on the Northern Take, this is the part of the show where we're going to do some rapid-fire questions uh, about all things Canadian, really. Are you ready to play along? Sure. All right. Sure. The one Canadian thing that you can't live without, Michael? My wife. Hey, I love that answer. Good boy. He brownie points for you. The one place in Canada that everybody should visit? Eastern Prince Edward Island, of course. You're on point today, brother. The most underrated Canadian place that deserves more attention? The far north. Absolutely. Yeah. The far north. Oh, boy. Wow. It's just so much, so much, so much we don't know. The far north. Right? We're kindred spirits on that one. Your favorite Canadian food? Uh, anything that I'm eating with my friends, family, and neighbors. You know, th th really, again, it's not about what I'm eating. It's who I'm with. So I, whatever that thing is, no doubt it came from very close by. It was produced by somebody I know. I know their story. I know, you know, all of it. So really anything that I get to eat in that way. So back to oysters. Slurping oysters. <laughs> Sounds good. Something that you always pack with you when you're going away. My Canadian passport. Yes, keep that close, near and dear. And finally, what makes you the proudest to be called Canadian? John, it's, it, uh, wow, rapid fire. So, healthcare, <laughs> us, we're a community. Like, nothing, nothing says it better than our universal healthcare system. It ain't perfect, but it, it's the best in the world. And look what happens when you don't have universal health care. I'm proud of it. Well, let's give a, some props up to Tommy Douglas and our Saskatchewan crew for bringing that in back in the day. Tommy uh, set the stage for one of the greatest gifts that Canada has ever, ever been given. Yes, he did. Well, I think that we've taken up more than enough of your time. So I, I've got to say thank you very much for being on the Northern Take with us here today, Michael. And uh, I, I will, I will be on your doorstep one day and sticking out my my tiny hand to shake your your sizably larger hand i, th I think so Aww. Uh, <laughs> then, uh, then i won't say goodbye john i'll simply say see you later yes buddy. sir thank you very much for being with us here today <laughs> awesome thanks for having me truly thank you john that's it for the northern take i'm john montgomery thanks so much for taking this journey with us 